Good evening, everyone, and welcome from Tallahassee. Welcome to the November 2023 Archaeology Hour. My name is Sarah Kraft, currently serving as president of the AIA Tallahassee Society. We in Tallahassee are really excited to have the honor of hosting this event. I've been so impressed by the talks we've already seen in the series, and I'm really excited to hear more from Dr. Chu this evening. Many thanks to Meredith Langlitz and Rachel Mead and all the others at the AIA for the invitation to host and for the assistance in preparing for tonight and for the entire series. The Archaeological Institute of America is North America's largest and oldest archaeological organization. Over 200,000 members worldwide, ranging from vocational archaeologists, students in archaeology and related fields, um, all the way to enthusiasts and interested members of the community. The AIA is dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things archaeological. And every member of the AIA receives a subscription to Archaeology Magazine and the option to also tag on a subscription to the more scholarly American Journal of Archaeology. In addition to our publications, the AIA offers opportunities to attend lectures of interest, such as this one, and other organized events related to local, national, and international archaeological sites and finds. And for those interested, chances to participate um, in excavations and on tours. There's a little bit of something for everyone at all ages and stages of life, of interest level and of availability, whether you wanna be a little involved or quite involved. You can get access to all of these things by becoming a member of the AIA. Many thanks to all AIA members who have either joined or renewed your memberships recently. Your membership fees contribute to good and important work across the globe, supporting research, excavation, education, and preservation efforts. If you are not a member and are interested in becoming one, uh, we would so appreciate it if you could take a few minutes when and if you can to support the AIA and its mission. You can do this by scanning the QR code on the screen or you can come back anytime to archaeological.org slash join. I believe uh, Rachel will also drop it into the Zoom chat for you to follow from there. When you do join, take a second to designate your local society and be sure to take advantage of all your member benefits, including eligibility for AIA awards and grants, as well as discounts on tours and registrations for conferences like our annual meeting. Students in the audience especially should note that annual memberships start as low as $30 a year, so definitely worth checking out. To all of you, whether you're members or donors or both, we are grateful for your support. You make it possible to continue research, fund educational experiences for students, preserve sites, publish new and exciting discoveries, and run programs for students, professionals, and archaeological enthusiasts. We have a terrific lineup of speakers for you this year, representing archaeology around the world. Tonight is the third in the AIA Archaeology Hour series, and I hope you'll come back to see them all. As a quick note, this lecture is a live presentation. It's being recorded by the AIA. Recording by attendees is strictly prohibited. The AIA respects the intellectual property of its uh, presenters and asks that viewers do the same. So thank you very much for your cooperation. There is no need to record anyway. If you can't stay for the full talk or want to rewatch it, tonight's presentation and all of the Archaeology Hour talks will be available on the AIA YouTube channel. I am delighted. To introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Catherine L. Chu, coming to us from the University of Alabama. 
Dr. Chu is an anthropological archaeologist and paleoethnobotanist whose research interests include foodways in the past and present, Andean archaeology, household archaeology, plant domestication, food sovereignty, agrobiodiversity, sustainability, GIS and data visualization, and responsible conduct of research. She received her MA and PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and is currently an assistant professor in anthropology at the University of Alabama, where she oversees the Ancient People and Plants Laboratory. Before I turn over the virtual microphone to Dr. Chu, I'd like to briefly call your attention to some upcoming events. First, the next Archaeology Hour, coming up on January 24th, features Dr. Jeff Altschul speaking on cultural resource management, what most archaeologists do for a living. I know that we won't want to miss this important discussion of trends and employment for archaeologists across the country. And if you'll indulge me for just a moment, I'd like to plug the next Tallahassee Society lecture, also coming to us in January 2024 right on the heels of the next Archaeology Hour. On Thursday, January 25th, Dr. Patty Gerstenblith of DePaul University will be giving the Norton Lecture on Disrupting the Market in Antiquities, Saving Archaeological Heritage for the Future. This talk is an in-person event, so if you're in the Tallahassee area, we would love to see you there. I think we're now ready for the main event, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Chu. Dr. Chu, we are all yours. Fabulous, thank you so much. I'm gonna now switch over so that you can see my screen. All right, thumbs up if you can see it. Awesome, great, let me make sure that's up. All right, y'all. Um, Thank you so much, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction. Welcome, everyone, and really good evening. I greatly appreciate y'all taking the time to spend the next hour with me in this virtual space. Special thanks also to the Archaeological Institute of America for this very unique opportunity to share my research. I really can't say enough good things about the amazing public engagement work that AIA is doing. So please do go and attend those other talks as well as other events. Uh, today, we are embarking on a captivating journey. We're not just unearthing ancient diets, we're reading stories etched into time through the foods of Peru's ancient north coast. Each culinary relic, from a simple kernel to a lavish feast, opens up a chapter in the vibrant narrative of a culture's soul. In this presentation, we're going to traverse the desert landscape of Peru, delving into the heart of the Moche civilization. Here, there's a tale of contrasts, the splendor of elite feasts set up against the daily sustenance of commoner folk. This is where our story gains a lot of depth, revealing through food insights into the social fabric, the collective psyche, and really resilience in times of upheaval. Before we delve into this ancient culinary world, let's really reconsider what food can tell us about where we've been and who we are as people. Imagine each meal as a cultural microscope, magnifying the intricate web of social interactions, technological advancements, and economic conditions. Food can be seen as a very potent symbol. It's a lens through which we can view the complexities of social structures, revealing stories of power, identity, and community embedded in the very act of eating. Given the daily need to procure, to cook, and to consume food, all of us do this, food can tell us so much about who we are and where we come from. So for this culinary tale, we're going to focus on the relationship between food and status. Now, the lines drawn between status groups are reinforced in daily life. Through modern advancements, um, some of those distinctions have disappeared, but food is and was in the past a very important boundary marker due to such factors that we know of as price, as rarity, as cultural meaning. It's worth noting, however, that notions about the valuation of specific foods or dishes and their associations with status have to be interpreted within their very own specific political, cultural, and temporal contexts. 
So fashions and food experience flux over time, for example, sometimes overturning some traditional categories, right? We know of chocolate, for example, once an exclusive luxury of European aristocracy, gradually found its way into the hands of soldiers in the trenches, symbolizing the fading lines between um, elites and normal everyday people. This remarkable journey from elite delicacy to a universal comfort food mirrors the broader currents of societal change and the democratization of what was once rare and coveted. Another compelling narrative of culinary resilience and innovation emerges from the roots of American cuisine. Soul food, for example, born from the adversity faced by enslaved Africans in America, stands as a profound example of culinary resilience. This cuisine is a rich tapestry woven from survival, ingenuity, and cultural fusion. It demonstrates how marginalized groups have shaped and enriched our culinary landscape, turning scarcity into a legacy of wonderful flavor and tradition. So as we turn the page now to the first chapter of our story, our setting is the very majestic Andean region of Western South America. Here in this beautiful land that is now Peru, a tapestry of complex societies was woven over millennia, thousands of years. We focus on this diverse region characterized by coastal deserts, soaring highlands and lush jungles to set the stage for our exploration. Zooming in on our geographic canvas, we encounter the unique environment central to our narrative. Our attention shifts to the narrow, arid stretch of the Peruvian coastal desert, a land that I think is defined really by stark contrasts. Here between the towering Andes and the vast Pacific Ocean, a tropical dry climate prevails. Despite the challenging conditions, this environment played a very important role in the preservation of crucial archeological evidence. Amidst this very unforgiving landscape, we find islands of fertility that played a central role in the development of ancient societies over deep time. In the vastness of the coastal desert, every few kilometers, there's some green valleys that emerge like oases fed by rivers descending from the Andes. These fertile pockets, the lower valleys, were the cradle of the Moche civilization, a society that harnessed the harsh environment to create a thriving culture. So let's dive into the heart of the Moche world where our main narrative unfolds. The Moche, a people of remarkable complexity, flourished along the North Coast around AD 100 to 850. For those of you in the know, that's around the time of the classic Maya. Known for their rich material culture, they were a mosaic of valley-based polities that were united by a shared artistic and architectural tradition. Our focus narrows to the Hecatepeque Valley, it's a mouthful, a microcosm of the broader Moche sphere where the intricacies of our story really comes to life. So as we piece together the Moche timeline, we gain a clearer view of the societal shifts that form the backdrop of our culinary exploration. In the Northern Moche realm, the passage of time is marked by distinct ceramic styles, dividing history into early, middle, and late periods. We concentrate on the late Moche period, characterized by political fragmentation and social upheaval. It's really in this era of turmoil that our investigation of elite and commoner foodways begins, offering insights into the broader pattern of psychology, of social relations, and survival strategies. So imagine a time machine taking us back to the Moche civilization. Our first stop, it's the, Moche, it's the magic um, Waka de Luna site. Picture this temple, not just as a mound of adobe bricks, but as a buzzing hub of Moche life echoing with ceremonies and rituals. Its abandonment during cataclysmic natural events like El Nino's marks a pivotal chapter in our story, reshaping the Moche world. From these grand architectural feats, let's zoom into the lives of those who are walking those very corridors of power. Step into the shoes, for example, of the Moche elite, where every gold ornament and ceremonial vessel tells the story of power and divine connection. The Lord of Sipan's tomb, a treasure trove of history, throws open a window to a world where the elite didn't just live. They orchestrated a spectacle of rituals literally embodying their gods. Now visualize a scene straight out of the Moche artist's palette, the sacrifice ceremony, for example. Here, the elite's power is on full display, 
not just in their ceremonial regalia, but also in the command over life itself and in the very presentation and consumption of human blood. This dramatic tableau is a stark reminder of the deep chasms that existed within the Moche social hierarchy. As we ponder these displays of power, we also witness a shift in the location of settlements as elite power grows in the late Moche period. During this period, the Moche, once thriving in the valleys, now begin to retreat to these hilltop fortresses. This dramatic shift, a response to what we think is a brewing storm of political and environmental upheaval, marked by such events as severe drought, sets a new scene for our exploration of their daily life and food security. Our journey now takes us to two remarkable sites, each a unique story in terms of the Moche culinary saga. Imagine two neighboring worlds, San Jose de Moro, a bastion of elite extravagance and sacred ritual activities, and on the other hand, Cerro Chapen, a commoner's refuge, fortified against the tides of insecurity. These sites, mere kilometers apart, are our stages for unraveling the story of Moche culinary practices. Here we ask, did the echoes of elite feasts resonate in the humble hearts of Cerro Chapen's farmers? To weave together this intricate culinary tale, we delve into a literal treasure trove of archaeological clues. In our toolkit, we have a blend of botanical, that's plant, faunal, which is animal, and artifactual data, enriched with some spatial analyses with understanding of where activities were taking place. This approach, like assembling a complex puzzle, reveals the final, finer details of moche dining, opening up windows into their social and cultural landscapes. Now picture a pyramid, not of stone, but of people and of power. At its apex, the moche elite, their lives a tapestry of ritual and splendor. And then the vast base, the commoners, their existence, a daily dance of resilience and resourcefulness. Our exploration at these two sites peels back layers of this social pyramid, seeking answers to pressing questions. How did the extravagant world of the elite intersect with the everyday lives of commoners? Now let's step back into the field where the story of the moche comes alive through excavation and through discovery. Our time machine now takes us into the heart of the action that digs at the two sites, San Jose de Moro and Cerro Chapen. Here amidst the dust and the excitement, hundreds of samples, that's bags of dirt from the excavations were collected, each of them holding clues to the moche's culinary secrets. This painstaking work, and I can attest to that because I was the one doing it, is the foundation of our journey into the past. From these collected pieces of the ancient life, we begin to construct a sense of what the Moche's culinary world was like. The organic remains from these excavations are like little whispers from the past. We get seeds, we get bones, we get fragments of pottery, each of voice telling us about the Moche's relationship with their environment and with their meals. This very rich tapestry of so-called eco-facts is key to unlocking the secrets of ancient Peruvian cuisine. Now imagine stepping into San Jose de Moro, a site steeped in centuries of pilgrimage and ceremonies, particularly around death and burial. This ancient hub bustling with the elite's religious activities offers a really great window into their opulent lifestyle. It's here among adobe pyramids that we unearth clues to the extravagant feasts that marked the lives of the Moje upper crust. Hovering over San Jose de Moro through Google Earth, we see a complex of huacas, which are actually sacred mounds, each a testament to the Moche's architectural genius and religious fervor. This aerial perspective sheds light on the grandeur of their ritualistic landscape, a literal stage for the elaborate ceremonies of the elite. For over two decades, archaeologists have been piecing together the rituals and the rites performed here, each artifact a piece of the puzzle of Moche society. From the tombs we find to the temples, we gather insights into the Moche's relationship with death and the divine. Their approach to death was as intricate as their approach to life. Skeletal analyses at San Jose de Moro, for example, reveal a very complex ritualistic treatment of the dead, suggesting a journey of the elite's remains, possibly across vast distances for burial in this very sacred ground. Such practices offer a nice glimpse into the profound spiritual beliefs of the Moche. One figure stands out in the pantheon of Moche deities, 
offering a unique insight into their spiritual world. The discovery of the priestess at the site in 1991 was a revelation. Buried with symbols of power and divinity, these priestesses provided a fascinating window into the role of women in Moje religious life. Their presence at San Jose de Moro hints at a very powerful cult central to the spiritual fabric of the Moche. Identified as one of the core figures in the Moche uh, sacrifice ceremony, she played a pivotal role in enacting ritual scenes in real life. In the rich tapestry of Moche iconography, the burial theme also stands out, and it may inform our picture of what was happening at San Jose de Moro. This very vivid scene with its processions and its offerings mirrors the elaborate burials unearthed by archaeologists working at the site. It's in these artistic expressions that we see the interplay of life, of death, and ritual in Moche society. On the right side of this vibrant scene, we can revel in the festivities celebrating the deceased, where bowls of food offerings descend into the tomb. This captivating artwork is not just an artistic expression, it's a literal mirror reflecting the grandeur of Moche funerary practices as seen in the archeological record. Now moving from iconography to other aspects of the material record, let's explore the food evidence that was found at San Jose de Moro. In the heart of San Jose de Moro, our digs over several years reveal layers of Moche activity, including short-term feasting events. The Cava de Fiesta, or the party layer, for example, is a treasure trove showcasing things like large capacity vessels and signs of intense cooking activities. These relics speak of grand feasts and gatherings, a testimony to the moche's affinity for abundance and celebration. Each food remnant marks a spot where the moche gathered, they cooked, and they celebrated leaving behind a trail of clues for archaeologists to piece together their gastronomic traditions and their ties to social and religious life. The plant remains identified here offer a botanical snapshot of moche cuisine, from algarobo, which are mesquite pods, to maize or corn and chili peppers. The diversity of ingredients speaks volumes about the moche's culinary sophistication and their connection to the land and to local ingredients. Let's add another dimension to our understanding by visualizing these botanical finds. Now take a second, envision a starry sky of moje foods. Each star plot here represents a sample. The radiating spokes here reveal different quantities of plant remains creating patterns that show us the varied palette of moje food activities. These visualizations aren't just scientific graphs, the representations of diverse meals and moments of moche life. Mapping these star plots, we begin to see where the culinary action was at San Jose de Moro. Like detectives, food detectives in this case, we map the star plots to pinpoint where the moche's major food related activities buzzed. These hot spots around large cooking vessels paint a picture of bustling kitchens and communal feasting, a vivid scene of moche life. The intertwining of food and funerary practices becomes even more evident as we look at the burial evidence. In San Jose de Moro, the dead were never really actually that far away from the living. These red highlights show burials displayed in yellow near feasting areas, suggesting meals may have been prepared next to the deceased, intertwining food with ritual and remembrance associations that persist even to more modern times in the region. From these feasting areas, we uncover evidence of a special fermented moche brew. In the moche world, maize or corn wasn't just a staple on your plate. It was literally transformed into chicha, a beer that was likely a centerpiece of their gatherings. The maize kernels we found sprouting tiny roots as part of the process of germination, which kickstarts the recipe, whisper tales of this ancient brewing tradition, a process of transformation from grain to celebratory drink. Let's visualize this ancient brewing process that fueled moche festivities. Since some of these traditions live on today, we actually have a pretty good idea of what um, the moche brewers may have been doing while they were at work. Chicha making involves soaking maize, a series of boiling and sieving steps to ultimately fermenting and imbibing this alcoholic brew. 
Similar to Belgian beers, chicha is not a single homogenized drink. In fact, today there are variations native to each region and each group. You can find chicha today made with different ingredients like manioc, um, which is cassava, wild fruits, cacti, rice, potatoes, and other flavorings, depending on the taste preferences of a particular region uh, where this chicha is brewed. Now here at this site, the potential additives and enhancers we find are really intriguing. In these party layers, we unearth plants with mind altering or psychoactive powers, coca leaves containing the cocaine alkaloid for increased stamina, San Pedro cactus containing mescaline for hallucinogenic experiences, and potentially what may have been the mythical Uyuchu plant commonly depicted in moche iconography, which scholars believe could possibly have been used in blood rituals to prevent clotting and to assist with bloodletting activities. These finds hint at a moche world where drink may have been served as a conduit to other realms of consciousness, achieved through consuming a beverage mixed with hallucinogens. Historical accounts from other parts of the Andean region hint at this practice, suggesting that these rituals were not just gathering, but also transformative experiences elevated by these potent additions to their brew. Now, beyond drink, we also have the opportunity to get really up close and personal with meals as we analyze fragments of paleo feces, essentially old human poop. These remnants containing seeds and bones that survived the digestive tract, so the more hearty remnants of food, tell us not just what the moche ate, but about how they combined flavors and ingredients, offering a direct link to their everyday meals and their culinary traditions. The ingredients that we found suggest that individuals in this area could have been eating a spicy fish stew, accompanied perhaps by some pulses or wild legumes, some toasted amaranth with a lovely side of sweet guava, perhaps as a palate cleanser. This reconstruction from paleofecal remains isn't just about ingredients, it's about experiencing a meal from a bygone era, bringing us closer to understanding the moche's everyday life and culture. Moreover, by mapping this distribution of paleofecal remains, we identify where the moche may have dined and celebrated. These maps give us a spatial narrative of their gatherings, providing a very unique perspective on the social dynamics of their feasts. Shifting focus, we now move away from the culinary world of elite San Jose de Moro to the lives of everyday moche people. This juxtaposition offers profound insights into disparities and tensions within the moche society, reflecting broader patterns of social and political life. Journey with me now to nearby Cerro Chapen a stark contrast, again, to the opulence of San Jose de Moro. Here, the commoner's world reveals a narrative of resilience and resourcefulness. The architecture of the hilltop forest fortress speaks volumes about the anxieties and fears of its inhabitants, painting a picture of a society bracing for a time of uncertainty. A Google Earth view of Cerro Chapen reveals the strategic position of this ancient settlement, nestled between valuable water sources, and again, this is the desert, so water is literally life, and fertile lands. This aerial perspective provides a unique vantage point for understanding the daily struggles and the triumphs of inhabitants. The dense configuration of Cerro Chapen structures revealed through detailed mapping shows a community that was tightly woven together, both for defense and for protecting each other in daily life, the towering perimeter walls speak of a community that was poised for protection, a testament to the turbulent times they lived in, marked by environmental instability. Focusing on a specific household provides a microcosm of commoner life in the Moche society. In this commoner household, highlighted in red, for example, our excavations uncover the intimate spaces where daily life unfolded. The interconnected rooms and the terraces paint a picture of residents living in very close quarters, managing their resources, and navigating the challenges of their era. With 3D modeling, we breathe life into the walls and the stones of the structure. This reconstruction not only provides a glimpse into Moche architectural styles, 
but it also invites us to walk through the spaces where daily activities, conversations, and family meals took place. Let's explore the dietary habits and culinary practices within this particular commoner household. An analysis of food remains from this household reveals a diet that focused on staple foods, reflecting a lifestyle of frugality, of simplicity, and of practicality. The stark difference in culinary habits from the elite at San Jose de Moro underscores the lifestyle differences that probably existed within Moche society. Moreover, unlike the splashy feasts at San Jose de Moro, food activities in this particular house are clustered around certain areas, much like they are in our own homes today. Our findings at this particular house not only tell us what was eaten, but also how these ancient people managed their resources. The unexpected and fascinating discovery that came out of the excavation in this area was the unearthing of a compost pit located directly within the walls of the structure. The compost feature is a prime example of the moche sustainable practices. The presence of camelid dung or llama dung gathered from kept herds along with discarded plant and animal remains from past meals illustrated a sophisticated understanding of resource management, turning waste into a resource for future cultivation. When we actually layer all the layers of food related data, what we have is a picture that emerges of where household food activities took place, including areas with limited evidence of food that could have represented perhaps sleeping areas where a family may have rested, giving us a very intimate look into the past life ways, or perhaps an understanding of how people occupied and utilized the spaces they inhabited. By adopting a sort of spatial approach to the data, we can envision households with faces, right? People with faces, past lives, and arrive at a very intimate sense of how the bulk of the population lived and experienced everyday life. In contrast to the excess and the sloppiness of food activities in San Jose de Moro, the residents of this house lived in a state of what we think is heightened anxiety, perhaps making the most out of the plants that they had by minimizing waste and turning refuse, the remnants of meals, into nitrogen-rich fertilizer. Now, when we synthesize the data from both sites, when we bring them together, uh, we see contrasting lifestyles and the diets become quite different. When the food plants are categorized into use categories, it is apparent that while the Sarah Japan residents relied mainly on staple foods like maize or corn and squash, the elites at San Jose de Moro had much greater access to highly coveted foods like chili peppers for flavor and fruits with sugar, uh, including guava and passion fruit. A comparison of the animal remains recovered from both sites also reveals differences in the faunal assemblages, particularly regarding the greater consumption of marine fish at San Jose de Moro. When shell types are broken down into their respective categories, however, it becomes even more evident that the pattern of shell consumption at both sites is also vastly different. While San Jose de Moro exhibits evidence for all types of shellfish and a huge range, a huge amount of diversity, Sarah Japan residents almost exclusively consumed one type, and that's the land snail, or a type of escargot. These snails were thought to be luxury goods based on the prevalence of scenes in the iconography showing collection parties aimed at gathering terrestrial snails from semi-arid hill environments. Their presence in the household may be explained by the fact that Sarah Japan Hill is a natural habitat for these creatures. This indicates that the residents of the commoner house were very much what we think was eating locally. When the ingredients in the domestic cuisine of Sarah Japan and the haute or elevated cuisine of San Jose de Moro are shown together, scaled roughly according to the prevalence that we find them by at these sites, we get a visual sense of how social inequality and different contexts of consumption can be manifested at the micro scale in terms of the plant and animal data. While the elite individuals at Moro participated in celebrations of life and death marked by the consumption of copious amounts, and copious is really the right word, of food and drink, and the presence of luxury foodstuffs and perhaps mind altering substances, the commoner household at Sarah Japan had access to far less. 
Resentment surrounding status-based distinctions may have resulted from such elaborate displays of wealth and exclusivity at a time when the poor were trying to make do with what they had. To what extent this gap between rich and poor played in the eventual demise of the Moche around 800 AD really remains to be seen. These stark differences are kind of represent, uh, reminiscent of the events of the Great Depression in the 1930s. While many in the US were suffering from the fallout of economic collapse, you had high society individuals like William Randolph Hearst who were engaging in even more elaborate displays of conspicuous consumption. This image of an elaborate dinner at Hearst Castle contrasts really sharply with the scene of farmers at the dinner table during the harvest season in central Ohio. In the collective consciousness of older Americans, the 1930s was a time of frugality, which was reflected in the creation of filling meals made of very simple and few ingredients. In the minds of these individuals, and if you talk to them, they will usually say this, waste is, waste is abhorrent and really not tolerated. The rich pageantry of the social elite was most likely quite difficult to stomach. So what are the lessons we can learn? The food assemblages suggest that commoner residents were really not prone to misusing food resources, keeping the household relatively spotless, which perhaps indicates an obsession with tidiness and frugality. The types of strategies that we see here are often implemented by women who play a large role in managing food insecurity, and we know this from ethnographic examples around the world. While these individuals may have lived under the constant looming threat of conflict and perhaps warfare, life persisted. They looked after their animals. They kept guinea pigs inside of the house and llamas nearby and used both of them as their primary source for animal protein. They regularly trekked down the hill slope to nearby canals and fields to manage and maintain their crops, bringing water and food back up the hill, something we don't have to do today. They relied heavily on starchy staples. They collected wild plants from around the agricultural regions. They incorporated them into their meals. They foraged for land snails that were found conveniently on the cacti growing on the hill. And they added a little touch of luxury to their lives and meals, eating locally. They took the remains of their meals and they composted them, creating fertilizer to enhance agricultural yields. Still, nevertheless, despite the necessity of routine, life probably wasn't like what it was before. We can infer that uh, these disparities may have fueled some resentment perhaps, along with environmental cat catastrophe in the form of several bouts of severe drought and warfare, existing societal weaknesses in the Moche political system may have contributed to their downfall at the end of the eighth century AD. It has been difficult lately not to draw parallels between past and present when thinking about how humans adapt to adversity in times of food scarcity. When catastrophe strikes, whether the culprit is disease, as we saw during the pandemic, the environment, war, or policy, production and supply chains are invariably disrupted. Many are left vulnerable as the impacts of short food, uh, food shortages reverberate throughout society. And although those with less material wealth and social, economic, and political access have, I would argue, always coped with insecurity and uncertainty on multiple fronts, in moments of crises or intersecting crises, stress is intensified. Meanwhile, the underlying social tensions stemming from extreme inequality are suddenly exposed and magnified, threatening the stability of the existing order. These class-based distinctions can lead, as we've seen time and time again throughout history, to social unrest and to uprisings, such as the Women's March on Versailles, one of the earliest and most significant events of the French Revolution, precipitated by the high price and the scarcity of bread, a staple. The food riots during the Irish potato famine, and also the Southern riots over food shortages during the Civil War. Even now, the stress instigated by the war, uh, multiple wars, disease, and inflation have led some to predict the rise of populist movements around the world in the face of rampant socioeconomic inequality. Today, our exploration of the Moche's culinary world, from the elite's lavish feasts to the commoner sustainable practices, offers a very unique and specific lens into their society. Food, at the end of the day, in its myriad forms, serves as a powerful storyteller 
revealing the complexities of social structure, cultural identity, and human resilience. As we close the story, we leave with a deeper understanding of how the study of ancient cuisine can illuminate the rich tapestry of human history. And we ponder what the lessons of the past can tell us about how we think about the present and about our futures. So thank you so much for joining me on this fascinating journey into the heart of Moche civilization. Your participation, your enthusiasm, and your curiosity have made this exploration all the more rewarding. I'm happy to take any questions. You can also reach out to me at my email address on this slide. That's klchiou at ua.edu. And again, thank you so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. And I hope you can walk away with some greater appreciation for how food, which we eat, reveals so much about ourselves as well as the societies that we live in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chu. I see all the emojis um, rising up from the bottom of the sea of emojis speaks um, very highly of, of how impressive this talk was. And we have a lot of questions in our Q&A from our food detectives. I think you would have charmingly uh, talked about investigating some of these things. So we're gonna try and get to as many as we can, y'all. Um, the One of the first questions that came up was thinking about human sacrifice and how it, um, uh, uh, works with alongside other kinds of, of ceremonies wanting to know if if women were um part of those and mm -hmm. some sort of apparent social caste to any of that yeah i mean we do have examples in the andean record throughout of uh, both men and women being found sacrificed um there's a famous inca mummy bundle for example on the top of high peaks that certain explorers have found. In terms of the moche, a lot of what we see in the iconography is a depiction of prisoners being paraded. So usually you'll find them with ropes tied around their neck. They're usually shown mostly naked. Um, and in the process of um, going through bloodletting and then eventually you know, the presentation of the blood to certain individuals and the consumption of that blood. So in terms of social caste, at least in terms of the iconographic record, a lot of it seems to be like prisoners, probably either other competing moche groups or groups outside of the moche. Um, so they may have been individuals of some status if they were warriors. Uh, but yeah, my understanding is that that's pretty much the case. That's a great question though. Actually, sort of building on that, there's another question that has both to do with offerings of food, not of people, um, but thinking about um, sort of class, there's a question about food offerings um, for the dead. Do they ever occur inside or beneath these lower class uh, moche households? That is an amazing <laughs> question. Okay, so my latest sort of foray back to Cerro Chapin, this was about right before the pandemic. I haven't actually been back since, unfortunately, but we did do an excavation of another household. And what we found actually is um, a vessel that was buried into the floor of that particular house. So one thing I didn't mention about Sarah Japan is that, you know, it's very interesting because as I mentioned before, it's a site that popped up at a very specific moment late into the cultural sequence. We think that it popped up because suddenly there's fears about people's security. So people are banding together, they're moving to higher grounds, they're building sites with fortifications, oftentimes hastily. These aren't really great um, structures. Um, they're kind of brittle, they're thrown together quite quickly. Um, and we don't think that people are actually there for that long. So it may have been a situation, I always like to tie this back to Lord of the Rings because I'm a big loader nerd. Um, it's like Helm's Deep, right? Somewhere people go in times of trouble and then at some point something changed and they left. So what we're thinking is based on what we know so far, given that people had time to like ritually close houses, bury certain objects in floors, that um, there was sort of this moment of recognizing that they were going to leave and wanting to leave something perhaps behind ritually. And so at least in that particular circumstance, it doesn't seem like people were like um, chased out of the site or God forbid killed. We have no evidence of bodies. Um, but yeah, definitely in terms of offerings, we do have some evidence of that. Uh, so there may have been some emotional ties to it, I imagine. Cool. Actually, so again, this, this, sort of brings up for me some some threads that are showing up in the Q&A about proximity of different mm. kinds of 
activities um, and events. So I'm thinking um, about, you know, if they are defecating where they're also feasting, if they're burying people beneath their homes where, you know, they're preparing food and these kinds of things. Were there concerns or any apparent effects of, you know, contamination and pollution or anything? Yeah, this is a fascinating thing. And it's actually a very big area of anthropological inquiry about like um, structuring spaces, right? I think we living in our own society today have very strict understandings of where things should take place, right? Um, Nowadays, we have like kitchens that are perhaps a little bit separate from a dining area, although increasingly we like to integrate those two to get more of a communal family vibe. But even just moving back like a few decades ago, like those were completely separate spaces and even moving further back into like the Georgian period, you wouldn't be able to see that in rich households, right? Nobody wanted to see such mundane activities like food preparation um, that was like hidden away. Um, and you had more of the display and the presentation in like large elaborate dining halls, for example. So um, even the idea of like what's clean and what's not where things should take place. Um, I know a lot of us that travel to places like the UK always think it's really bizarre that like their clothes washer is like in the kitchen. You know, that's like a strange thing for us. We're like that belongs in a separate room. So we do have these very cultural notions of where things take place. Um, in our own culture, we have that saying, you don't shit where you eat, excuse my language. I'm from New Jersey, so I'll use that as an excuse. But um, for other cultures, I mean, even if you go back to times like um, in Europe just a few centuries ago, there's so many accounts of just like how dirty streets were, where people would like throw um, waste out the window down into the streets. The accounts of Dublin in the 1800s are absolutely fascinating in terms of the descriptions of the smells and the sights. Um, so this idea of sanitation, again, it's partially based in our sort of modern understandings of science and cleanliness. But I think also like we have to shy away from assuming that that was always the case around the world across time. So the interesting thing for me in terms of finding this, this evidence, which I did not anticipate, was why, again, is there is there poop next to places where people are cooking, right? Was it because people were so blitzed out of their minds that like it was like Versailles where we have accounts of people, noble women, noble men going to the bathroom in the hallways, right? That was not something that was restricted just to, to here. That's definitely, we have accounts elsewhere. Or was it because like the people that were cooking were so busy that they thought like, okay, I can't like, you know, go away from uh, where I'm cooking right now and I just have to go to the bathroom and hide the evidence and throw it into the fire. Um, who knows? There's plenty of theorizing that you can do, but I think it's absolutely fascinating to see. And this is the power of archaeology, too, is like all these things um, that we normally wouldn't hear about, these really intimate looks at past human lives and behaviors, we have access to it through very interesting evidence. So I don't have the exact answer for you, but it does bring up a lot of very interesting questions. Um, and I'm always curious about people's thoughts about it. So email me. Do you hear that, everybody? Send her an email. Yes. Um, so we um, and and I'm I'm trying to sort of weave together some of these questions as best I can mm -hmm. for the time, and I'm seeing a lot of interest in the mystery fruit. <laughs> um, about what 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 is it? Um, can we look at iconography to help figure it out? What what do you think it might be? Yeah. Okay, you guys, so like if you're ever going to become a plant archaeologist, like one of the enduring mysteries that you can solve is identifying what this mysterious Miyuchu fruit is. So it's something that we see, again, identified in iconography. It's about yay big, and we know that because we see it in archaeological sites as well. I haven't been able to access any remains, but there have been photographs from previous excavations showing this stuff. <laughs> Sorry, so it exists. Um, unfortunately, I've been trying to track it down. And um, just as a sort of side note, there's this like remarkable story of like how it was given to this botanist and this botanist rode a bus and the bus got robbed and then his um, suitcase got taken and then our evidence got lost forever. So who knows where it is right now, but it has at least been found before. So we have the potential if we ever locate it, perhaps to do some ancient DNA analyses to see if we can like certifiably say that it is a correlate of some modern plant. 
Now we have botanists who have done some research and tried to identify what this plant is based on certain properties, based on the way the plant looks, the fruit, which is this kind of like comma shaped fruit. Um, the sort of most convincing one that we think is potentially the candidate right now is a genus known as Guarea. So every time you see this plant in the iconography, it's shown with like monkeys. It's shown on a tree with monkeys. Um, and again, just to remind you of where we are, we're on the desert coast. Uh, they're probably, today there are no monkeys. We don't know of the past if that was the case because when the Spanish came, they definitely impacted the local environments a lot. So these relic forests that existed before that um, we have accounts of having high amounts of biodiversity no longer exist. But it seems like they were indicating that this plant may have been perhaps Amazonian in origin. And today there is a plant that exists in the Amazon that uh, certain monkeys gravitate towards that has properties that include chemicals that allow for uh, essentially the sort of stoppage of um, clotting. And the idea is that if you stop clotting, you allow free flow of blood. So that if, you're, if your purpose is to gather lots of blood, from sacrificing all these individuals, that that's something that would be perhaps favorable. So that's actually um, a genus that's known as Guarea. There's a series of different potential candidates. I've got a couple samples that were sent to me by the botanist who um, proposed this particular theory. And so based on the fact that some of these seeds actually look like those particular seeds, there is the possibility that this random unidentified seed could be that fruit. But I can't say for sure 100%. Um, I think we need more research. Uh, one thing to sort of note for those of you who are interested in this region is that there hasn't been a ton of archaeobotanical work. Um, and so there's a lot that remains to be investigated. So if you get involved in these projects, if you find more remains, we have a better chance of nailing down what this is. And you can be the one to identify it for sure. So yeah. New detective. Yes, exactly. Uh <laughs> Great. Well, so we've gotten a lot of questions about trade um, of foodstuffs, specifically uh, raw versus processed. Um, there's a specifically a uh, question about chilies. And, mm -hmm. and I wonder if that might sort of play into another question that was posed about the fortifications um actually coming between these two sites so do we see trade do we see them sort of interacting and working together or are they um one defending from the other and how does how do you think trade of these different types of foodstuffs work into that yeah okay so that's a great question so i'm assuming by the the chili question it's referring to like are they entering these sites as like fresh sort of um fresh vegetables or are they like dried and used as flavoring? Um, that's a really great question. I mean, so in terms of at least the paleo fecal remains, we find a ton of this stuff embedded in there. Um, and I'm not sure if there's a way to tell whether or not they were desiccated and then rehydrated or if they came in like fresh. Um, that would be a really interesting thing to think about how to separate it out. But I know at least in terms of where chilies grow, I mean, they grow all throughout this region. There's one particular species that is particularly prominent. So for those of you that are familiar with Andean cuisines and have gone to Peru or eaten at a Peruvian restaurant, um, the yellow pepper, the ají amarillo, um, which is a capsicum bacotum for those of you plant nerds out there, um, that is pretty much what we find. Um, with some examples also of capsicum chinens, which is similar to like the habanero peppers, a little bit spicier. Um, so these peppers are interesting in that they're not super hot, at least the bacotum, which is the ají amarillo or the yellow pepper. Um, the chinens ones are a little bit spicier, so they could have been adding that more. Um, but even today, like I would say for the most part, even though the Peruvians may disagree with me that the food isn't terribly hot, but it is very, very flavorful. Um, the second question, which was about trade and interaction between the two sides, this is an interesting thing I've been thinking about for a long time. In terms of like who is buried there at that site, it seems like there were restrictions on your sort of status, right? So for the most part, we have like the very, very high elite, the people that were essentially acting like gods in real life in terms of the costumes they were wearing, the headdresses, they were probably involved in similar ceremonies. So um, interesting thing about them too, it seems like at any one point, someone was like 
the priestess. And then once she died, there would be another priestess. And they were basically reenacting these things over and over again. We have them in like giant chamber tombs. And then we have more sort of everyday normal tombs that were occupied by people doing um, specialized trade crafts like um, weaving, for example, or chicha brewers, so people that still have status, but were maybe a little bit lower. I don't know if like everyday commoner people were attending events at places like San Jose de Moro. We don't have clear evidence that suggests that they could have been, but at the same time, they could have been excluded because this was a very sacred site. And we have evidence of people making long treks over um, to be able to bury them there. Uh, so I can't say for sure, but in terms of like where items were moving in terms of ingredients, it seems like at least at places like San Jose de Moro, where again, we have evidence of extraordinary activities in terms of feasting that's marked by not only a large amount of food, but also the type of food. They were very much taking resources from the ocean. The ocean is roughly like 20 kilometers away, um, so not too far, but a lot of uh, marine fishes were showing up. And this seems to be a marker for status in that area based on the evidence we know so far. So lots of those, lots of shellfish in terms of the sort of protein that they were eating in terrestrial form, like the llamas and the little guinea pigs. Um, one thing that we think is marking special food is the way in which they're prepared, right? So everyday foods for the most part, like at places like Sarah Japan, it seems like they were boiled. And we still see this today in terms of like stews, right? Hearty stews, simple filling. You can add a bunch of starch to them, really bulk them up. But special food is roasted, like similar to, I guess, us and barbecue or um, like your roasted meat at like Christmas or something like that. Um, at poorer sites, we don't see this like large range of ingredients. A lot of it is like kind of, I wouldn't say boring, but like simple, simple starch, right? You can think of like us, like, oh, like rice and beans or like potatoes or something like that. Um, so lots of manioc or cassava. And for those of you not familiar with that, that's the thing that goes into bubble tea, the tapioca. Um, as well as squash. Um, and then in terms of meats, it seems like pieces of like llama and stuff probably added to a stew form. Um, but for the most part, like they're not, like their networks are not as extensive as what we see at um, the large elite site. So yeah, uh, I'm curious myself. I thought a lot about whether or not like these sites were really truly engaging, um, but they are roughly contemporaneous in that they're from kind of the same time period. So it is interesting to see like, these two sites in very close proximity, like literally you can see San Jose de Moro from the top of Sarah Chapin. Um, yeah, being so different, right? Two such different worlds right next to each other around the same time, around a time that's significant because we know it's kind of like towards the end, right? And based on the ice core evidence that we have, we know like there were three severe drought events. And if you live in the desert, some of you may be coming from the desert, you know that like if you don't have water, like everything falls apart. So um, it's kind of interesting to think whether or not they were getting along or if there was some friction there. Well, to that note, there was a question about irrigation systems mm -hmm. in the area and how that impacted the kinds of foodstuffs and um, mm -hmm. what was grown, that kind of thing. Yeah. So um those of you that live in the desert know that like irrigation is literally the key to life and survival. So if you go to this region today um, and you're in an area where there's no water, it basically looks like Tatooine. It's like extremely dry, uh, low biodiversity, doesn't really support a lot of life. But around the river areas, you see a bustling sort of ecosystem emerge. And so what people kind of learned early on and we have evidence of very early human occupation. This is an area where we have the rise of a lot of complex societies from millennia ago. So there's a deep human history here. People learned that in order to be able to maximize the use of the land, you have to create extensions off of these rivers that run down from the Andes. So think about it as gravity, right? You have high, high mountains, you have water coming down in the Andes, they flow into the Pacific Ocean, and then people are then moving water off of those rivers into different areas to create these wide swaths of arable land. So every single sort of civilization that came after the development of these kinds of technologies basically expanded these networks in order to be able to increase productive land and be able to have larger populations larger populations and more land means you have extra surplus that can be then used to feed 
the sort of administrative activities of that organization, and then things grow from there. An interesting thing too about irrigation networks is that there's a certain amount of water flow that comes down from the Andes, right? It's a set amount and it's very much dependent on how much rain they're getting year by year. In times where like there's issues like drought, immediately the water flow goes down and you can imagine that politics becomes a big thing. We see this today in like the Southwest or the West in general in the US where like people are like in LA are like, oh, we have our, you know, our golfing areas we need to sustain. And then suddenly, you know, some people are being told they can't water their lawns every day or, you know, whatever. Um, this kind of thing probably happened, right? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Sarah. You know, it's just, we're, we're, we're getting, we want to keep it to our, our archaeology. Yeah. So I'm going to cut you off then. I'm sorry to folks whose questions I didn't get to. I know Dr. Chu is happy to receive emails. Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks again to Dr. Chu, and I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you all so much. Good night. Bye.